What comes to your mind when you think of Joseph, the Joseph of our Christmas story today? I confess that I don't normally think of joy. Usually I think of somber obedience, you know, the kind gritting your teeth, knuckling down, nose to the grindstone kind of obedience. But joyful? No. (laughs) However, as I've been digging down into the details of this story, once again, I'm seeing it. So how was Joseph able to freely and joyfully join in with all that God was doing in this moment of history? Here is a main principle I think that we that we can pull from this story that Randy read just a few minutes ago from Matthew 1. Participating in God's plan requires surrendering my own. Participating in God's plan requires surrendering my own. That's where Joseph's joy came from. The thing is, this principle, it's... It's one of those that's hard to follow through on. Why is this principle so crucial to understand and follow? I think, number one, because here in America, we are not as inclined to surrender ourselves. The word surrender kind of has a, has a bad meaning to it. But number two is because when Jesus came, he brought joy. Even the angel's announcement was filled with joy, good news of great joy for all people. And then three, because our joy depends on it. Our joy depends on participating in God's plan. And for us to do that, we need to surrender our own plan, right? But by doing so, we can know deep joy, even when everything and everyone else around us are trying to steal it away. But what is joy after all? How would we define joy? Let me tell you how I'm defining joy today. I'm defining joy as that deep, that deep feeling of goodness that you get when all is well in the world. All is well in your world, at least, right? In the story Christmas Eve, which was a a TV movie that was done a number of years ago now, Loretta Young played the character of a a grandmother who was a, her name was Amanda Kingsley. Anybody ever see Christmas Eve? She plays Amanda Kingsley, who is a wealthy widow, and her son Andrew is currently running Kingsley Enterprises in New York City. And they are kind of butting heads, she and her son Andrew, because uh, he and his lawyers don't like how she hands out so much cash to homeless people and is helping them in the hospital and sending flowers and doing all these kinds of things. But the bigger part of the story is this. Andrew has three adult children who are estranged from him. There, there, was, there was misunderstanding. There was, there, there's been hatred and, and just awfulness from between them for years and they've been gone from the home and no one knows where they are well amanda goes to her doctor in fact she collapses on the street one night when she's handing out cocoa she collapses on the street and she finds out from the doctor that she has an aneurysm and that she has an unknown future she could she could pass away at any time And so she decides that she is going to try to find these three grandchildren and ask them to come home for Christmas. So she gets a satchel full of cash and she goes to Brooklyn where her husband first started his business and she finds this private investigator and she goes in and she asks him if he he will take this job and he will go and try to find her three grandchildren that are missing. They're just gone. And he decides to take the job with this pile of cash. (laughs) He he says, I'd be a fool not to do it. So he has one clue, one clue to go on. And so he heads to Nashville, and, and, and sure enough, he finds the youngest son who's trying to break into country music. And, and he makes a connection with him and asks him to come home for Christmas. And the son says, no, I, I, my dad did this and my dad did that, and, and there's just, it's just too awful 
I'm, I'm not coming home. But he does give him a clue, and so the private investigator goes out to L.A. and eventually finds the daughter who has been trying to break into acting, and, and she's teaching at a dance school, and, and he gives her the same message. Well, you, your grandma asked if I'd find you guys and asked if you'd come home for Christmas. And she says, no, I, 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 won't, I won't do that. There's just too much pain. There's too much all that. I'm not, I'm not going back. But he has one more clue to find the oldest son. Well, what happened was, years and years before, the oldest son uh, protested, was doing a war protest against his father's company because of their involvement with we making weapons, I guess. And so that didn't go well. And then he escaped to Canada to escape the draft. This is back, I guess, around the Vietnam War time or ish, yeah. And so... Uh, uh, so this private investigator goes to Canada, finds out, and he eventually finds this guy. And he's married, he has a son, and the same question. Your grandma would love you to come home for Christmas. And he says, absolutely not. Uh, I'm dead, you know, my father's dead to me. It's not happening. Well, the private investigator comes back. Good news, I found everybody, but the bad news is they're not, they're not coming. Thank you so much, and thank you so much. And, and, and so she's, she's somehow, she's convinced that they're going to come anyway. But she goes ahead with her normal Christmas Eve preparations. The tree is decorated, friends are gathering, and she invites the private in investigator as well. And so he's there, and her butler's there, and her maid, and, and so on. And, and some friends are there. And she says, welcome, come on in, have a drink, and we have some hors d'oeuvres, and we're going to wait until the kids arrive, the grandkids arrive. And... Everybody in the room is just feeling so awkward and feeling so sorry for her. But the hours pass, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Are you guys okay? We're, we're going to wait to eat until the, the grandkids arrive. And they're looking at each other and just wondering, this, she's going to be so disappointed. And 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And all of a sudden, they're there. And they have this joyous reunion and hugs and kisses. And, and she meets the, the grandson's wife and her great-grandson for the first time and her, the other grandson's girlfriend. And, and they're having this amazing reunion. And Andrew shows up at the door. He wants to talk to his mom. So they have a brief conversation. And his grandson walks over. And he looks up and he says, My mom tells me that you're supposed to be my grandfather. And he bends down and he says, Andrew, I guess that wasn't his name. His name was Harley. Harley, I'm not only supposed to be your grandfather, I am your grandfather. And he picks him up in his arms and one by one, his children come to him and confess and they're all forgiven and reconciled. And in the middle of this huge group hug, he says, Welcome home. It's the most joyful scene I've ever observed in my life. In a movie. <laughs> How was it possible for the Kingsley family to feel so much joy in that moment? Well, all was right in their world after so many years. And they were filled with joy. And you know, there's a sense in which that was a God moment, although they didn't necessarily mention that in the movie, but what was happening in this reconciliation and this forgiveness and all this was really a God moment to bring about such joy. And what was happening was they were each surrendering their own plans to participate in God's plan, really. And that's what we're going to see Joseph do here. That's what we see him do, like we did Mary last week. Participating in God's plan requires that I surrender my own plan. Well, Joseph had a dream, right? But I don't want to talk about that dream quite yet. I want to talk about the dream that he first had. Let's talk about it. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. This is how Matthew records it. While his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Pregnant? Pregnant? Mary is pregnant? 
we need to realize that the only, at, at this moment, Mary is the only one who knows that the Holy Spirit is the cause of her pregnancy. Joseph doesn't know that yet. Joseph only knows that she's pregnant and she doesn't believe she's done anything wrong. In fact, she's excited. Has she lost her mind? Is she blocking out memories or something? What's going on? His dream of being proud of his wife and his family is getting blocked. His plans of being respected and honored in his hometown are being smashed. In moments like these, character floats to the top of our actions and the tips of our tongues. And so because Joseph, her husband-to-be, was a righteous man, and because he did not want to disgrace her, he intended to divorce her privately. So we see that Joseph is a, a conscientious man. He's a law-abiding man. But I, I think included in this description is the idea that he, he is waiting himself, and he is longing and longing for and expecting the Messiah to come as well. He appears to be a gentle and compassionate man, and he doesn't want to make a public example of her. He may end up taking on some of her shame, some of her disgrace, and he may lose most or or all of the dowry that he paid for her. One Bible scholar says this, Joseph had basically had three choices at this point. Number one, he could expose Mary publicly as unfaithful. Uh, In this case, she might suffer stoning, although that was more rare in the first century. Uh, Choice two, he could remain engaged to Mary, betrothed to her. But this choice, it appeared to Joseph to, to require him to break the Mosaic law. Three, he could grant her a divorce, in uh, in which case Joseph just needed to hand her a written certificate in the presence of two witnesses. But Joseph is carefully turning these things over in his mind. In fact, my guess is he can think of nothing else at this point because he's a thorough and wise man. And so he's quickly thinking through all of his options. Joseph's own natural response to this crisis, though compassionate and gentle, falls short. You and I may be righteous, we may be faithful, we may be all around good folks, but all of our efforts also fall short. Your dreams still fall short. Joseph is at a crucial point of decision here. And he doesn't even realize the weight of it. Will he choose to push Mary and thereby Jesus away? Or will he choose to draw them in and draw close to Jesus? What about you? What dreams are you holding on to Is your dream based on your own ideas and your own intellect and your own understanding? Does it depend on your character to carry out your dream? Is your dream worth pushing Jesus away to receive it? What will you choose? You know, sometimes we have the opportunity to lay our dreams down in order, in order to receive something greater. But sometimes our dreams just crash to the ground. The dream dasher may be a, a God-initiated event like sending his son to earth to be my stepson. <laughs> a God-initiated kind of event. But maybe it's just life happening around us. Or it, may, could, it could be also the evil one with specific plans to try to destroy us. It might be a life-shaking thing, or it may be just a bump in the road. But regardless, your dream is gone. Perhaps you had a dream of the perfect relationship, but now you are in exile. Do you still have a dream of respectability and honor in your hometown? Are you holding to the dream of avoiding pain and suffering and even shame? Joseph's own character and dreams were found wanting. And so this was the perfect time to look to God. Even now, today, he has life and hope for each of us. But here's the thing. 
participating in God's plan requires that we're willing to surrender our own plan. Well, God does give Joseph a new dream. Uh, Verse 20 says, when he had contemplated this, he'd been thinking these things over, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. This greeting of son of David is, is so significant. It almost makes me think of when we were young and our parents, and we were in trouble with our parents, and they used all of our names. <laughs> Bradley Paul Trozen. This is significant. God is saying, this is way bigger than you, Joseph. I'm, I'm connecting you way back to David, and I'm connecting you into eternity. This is way, way beyond you, Joseph. I'm doing this with you and in you and all around you. And so the angel tells Joseph to not be afraid to take Mary as his wife. Because naturally speaking, that's insane. That's just crazy for him to do that, naturally speaking. It, it almost makes me think of the story of Hosea. It's not, it's not like the story of Hosea in every way, but God asks Hosea to do something pretty crazy. He asks Hosea, the Old Testament prophet, to go to the slave market and buy back his wife, who's been acting as a prostitute, to, to demonstrate God's amazing love for his people Israel, his unfailing love. But this is crazy. This is amazing. This is the impossible dream that he's having. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Oh, so she was speaking the truth. God so graciously is saying to Joseph, this child is my doing. This is from me. Your son is from me. And here is his name. Not that he will save his people from the Romans. No, God is about to solve the core issue of all mankind in Jesus. Hard to Hard for us to wrap our minds around in so many ways. We see a video like that. We see a guy playing Joseph and a little baby in a manger. And we think, savior of all mankind, going to save us from all of our sins. An impossible dream. But then Matthew, like he often does in his gospel, he connects the Old Testament to the new to help show his people, the Jewish people, and that that was his primary audience, Matthew writing to the Jews, showing them how Jesus met all the conditions of being the Messiah. And here's another one of those in verse 22. Matthew says, this all happened so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. 23, look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Matthew connects Jesus to Isaiah's prophecy, which is crucial for the Jews, and he connects Jesus to God, which is crucial for every one of us. God with us, the most preposterous dream of all, that God would come down and be with us. We've already sung about it this morning. But Paul said in Galatians 4, he said, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we we might receive the adoption as sons. And I love that because Paul flips the thing around, right? Because Joseph is about to adopt Jesus as his son and be his stepfather. And then Jesus adopts us. He adopts Joseph and Mary. He adopts all of us into the family of God. Ah, the power of a dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation 
where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, and the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, and every time he spoke the good news of great joy, he brought hope to people everywhere. The power of a dream in someone's life, a message from God. My hope for us today is that we're living the dream, not the American dream, living God's dream of amazing grace to all of us, to all of you, planned since before time began. Again, Paul says in Colossians 1, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery of which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here is God's dream. Here is God's dream for us here today. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you and you in Christ. To be adopted into Christ. Beyond that, any other dream he plants in our hearts is, is simply his goodness and grace to us. It's, it's frosting on the cake. But I urge you, I urge us to listen for his voice uh, because the good news of great joy extends far, far beyond us. Our church, our local church, exists now for those in our community who are not yet part of God's family. He's always asking us to think, to speak, to act by faith. And we're always inclined to think and speak and act by our senses and our, our emotions. But those who have experienced the forgiveness and grace of God are free to love and serve by faith, not out of fear. Remember that your father knows you the best and loves you First, let the joy of that thought be the reason why we're getting to know him better and better because he has made the joy possible. Participating in God's plan requires surrendering my own. And when Joseph hears this dream, he goes all in on all the dreams of God, that all that God has for his life. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did what the angel of the Lord told him. He took his wife, but did not have marital relations with her until she gave birth to a son whom he named Jesus. So Joseph obeyed the angel while counting the cost of what that would take. The loss of his reputation, uh, it would be shame, it would be the loss of livelihood, the loss of place in the community, uh, a dream marriage, whatever, whatever it was that was his dream. He considers all that as a loss now because he's going to accept the dream that God has. He obeyed while counting the cost. He obeyed not even knowing the end of the story because what does he know at this point? He knows that this is a God thing. He doesn't know hardly anything else at this time, but he obeys what he knows, what's been revealed to him. Kind of like Abraham. When God called Abraham to leave where he was, leave his family behind, and go to a new land. Abraham didn't know what was going. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the end of the story, but Abraham obeyed in that same, that exact same way. Oh, how we like to know, right? I want to know all the details. I want to know what all my options are. God wants us to walk by faith. And Joseph obeyed immediately and completely. Did you know that Joseph had four dreams? Some of you probably knew that already. He has four dreams. So this is the first dream. This is my son. You're going to name him Jesus. Uh, Another dream he has is just before Herod's soldiers arrive in Bethlehem. 
God appears to him in a dream. This is after the Magi had been there and so on. Sometime later, God appears to him in a dream, get out of here. And so they go to Egypt and that fulfills a prophecy again. He has another dream there after Herod dies, another dream there that brings them back to Israel, but they're afraid to be in the southern part of Israel, and so that he has another dream that leads them actually back to Nazareth, and that's where they end up for a number of years. Joseph obeys all those dreams. He's all in. He obeys God completely. It's an amazing Matthew also makes the point strongly, and I think this is part of Joseph's obedience too, that, that Joseph and Mary were not intimate together. In fact, during this time, it's, it's almost like he, he views her as just completely set apart for God's purposes and God's plans. And so Joseph, offers, in a sense, offers Mary to God and says, she's set apart for your purposes and plans. By naming Jesus, Joseph takes the baby as his own. He basically adopts him. Born of Mary adopted by Joseph, obviously of the line of David, and all is right in the world. Joseph was not a perfect man, but God chose him as the perfect father to raise his son, Jesus. Why? Because he was willing to give up everything to get Jesus. Are you willing to commit your dreams to God? I urge you to do so. If you haven't already, you don't know what the future holds anyway. And here's the thing, when, when we surrender our dreams and our plans to him, he may just give them back to us and say, go in my name. Or he may take our puny little dreams and explode them to be bigger and more crazy than we ever imagined that they would ever be or could ever be. Why not commit the unknown, which for us is almost everything, why not commit the unknown to the God that you can know? Be consumed not with knowing the future or with all the details, but with knowing him instead. We can receive Jesus today, not as, our, not as our baby, but as our Lord. Jesus grew to manhood, and though he was tempted like us in every way, he always remained obedient to the Father. His mission here was to voluntarily give up his life in our place and die the death that we deserve to die because of our sin against God. Believe in your heart and confess in your mouth that Jesus is Lord. He will save all who put their hope in him alone. He will adopt you into his family. God's plan, well, that's the place of true joy. Participating in God's plan requires surrendering my own. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't get it all right. Joseph didn't even get it all right. We won't get it all right. But all along the way, no matter what comes our way, we can know the joy of walking in step with our Father. And it's even sweeter and more complete when we do it together. Amen? I wish joy and peace to you today.